Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for <coughs> welcoming me on this. Um, I've journeyed around 13 hours this uh, last night and just arrived this morning and I think I still have some energy to talk to you because I've got to keep my energy for the next 20 days on the sea. It's going to be a tough mission because uh, this uh, Mavi Mamara took only less than a day. Now we're going to travel like almost 20 days on the very rough sea of Andaman Sea in Thailand, also in Bear Bengal. On the perspective of this, before I deliberate on this very uh, important uh, episode of this fight against genocide. I was speaking to the press TV just now that today we are not talking about only genocide in its historical perspective. And we thought that it was, it is over, there's no more of such thing. But uh, we have to face the reality that it's, it's happening now, it's happening even worse. We're not talking about only genocide at the level of people being killed. It is about the erasing of, in totality, of everything that is existing towards a community. And therefore, the Myanmar case, um, which is focused on a minority ethnic called the Rohingya, which anthropologically was uh, refused as one of the listed uh, citizenship of that country. It was used to be Burma in 1988, 1987, it was then changed to Myanmar. In 1982, because of the citizenship law enacted by the junta regime, the military regime, it was by a stroke of a pen eliminated this community. And there were four or five communities eliminated out of that citizenship. And the biggest one is this minority called Rohingya. And it happens to be that these Rohingyas are all Muslims. Now, I just want to just tell you that it is not something that is new that is happening. I don't know whether you follow this, the news about what's happening currently in Myanmar, but it has been more than six decades of Ethnic cleansing now is becoming more and more strong evidence of genocide. And I, I do not want to deliberate what, what is the difference between ethnic cleansing and genocide because there's legal terms involved in that. But genocide is, yes, as you go by it, is actually eliminating everything that is in the existence of a community, even the seed of that community is demolished. It's, it's happening since 1947, 1948, the dependence of, uh, independence of Burma. British pushed this land called Arkan, which was inhabited by this Rohingya minority, and it was forced into Burma. All of a sudden, it becomes a Burma state. And then it was then under the military junta by General Navy, if you read the history. And he operated a 19 execution phases of this minority. And each phase of the execution is not less than 5,000 that he actually killed. They've got names of those operations. They call it the the, the last one, 1982, was this uh, Nasaka. It's, it's still continuing. And how do they, they do it? They do it 
in the most brutal way. You call down a village, you don't let any people coming out, and then they will send in gangs of extremists, Buddhists, and they'll cut off the legs of everyone that they see in the houses. Just make sure that they don't run away. It's not because they don't have ropes to tie them. It's just want to make sure that they don't run away. So they literally cut off legs of babies, children, women, elders, one by one in each homes until they run up to the end of that village and they shoot everybody and burn the bodies together in the house. And that's how I physically went and saw bodies without legs. So these brutal killings, you know, massacres, and there are many, many mass graves that was found. It was not even allowed to be visited by any international medias. It went up until 1994. These massacres went on no, because Myanmar was actually a very closed, uh, he's a, he has a very closed uh, policy of not allowing anybody to come in. And even there was a typhoon called Nargis, where the people of Myanmar, whether there are Muslims or Buddhists, have to suffer because of no food coming in from outside. At that very time, the government was carrying out a referendum of a constitutional amendment. They blocked all agencies, international agencies, to come in to help these people without food, just because they say we want to carry on this referendum. So we want you to go to the polling vote, to vote in the polling stations, and you have to just wait and they will give you food. The United Nations agencies and all other international agencies were barred from going inside. So this is the kind of, of regime that you have. That was 2008. The massacres was done in a, in a pattern that was deliberately orchestrated. They create just one incident of maybe a small quarrel in one village or in one shop because of certain things, sometimes it's because of the price. This one incident will then be made into justification to attack the whole village of the community. So all this happened without the knowledge of the international media and also a lot of other agencies were not able to, to catch this, this kind of things happening. <laughs> Up until 2012. 2012 was another wave of massacre. It started from a girl who was supposedly alleged to have been raped by three young people. And without investigation, they immediately pointed out that this was done by the Rohingyas. And then they started, and they burned not less than maybe 50 villages, they burned 20,000 homes in that very instance, 2012. And there was a record because we immediately sent our people inside and tried to gauge what is happening. And we saw like bodies in the villages, burnt bodies, and we saw arson mosque. And for your information, there was about 3,000 mosques before, and now it's only 80 left, I think, less than 100. So the attack was like rampant. They go to the villages, to the people, they kill them. It's arbitrary arrest, and then thousands are missing and tortured, and probably most of them have been killed. And then they were then asked to even uh, leave the uh, country 
and put them on boats. And I went to see the boats myself. If I were to just stand and call all other people to stand on the boat, because it was swept away and it drifted to Indonesia, so I was called by our our friends from Indonesia, please come quickly because there were three boats and two capsized. Everybody just vanished in the sea. And on that boat, if we were to stand, you can actually fit 70 people. That's the most. If you stand, you don't sit, you just stand. <coughs> and they put on that boat 800 people. I just couldn't believe my eyes. How can they do this? 800 people, 300 died in the sea. <coughs> and when they reached the shore, the Indonesian shore, because the drifter, there was like pushed by the Navy of Thailand. And uh, at that instant, we also did the same. The Malaysian Navy also pushed them back. Some of them floated, and one reached in Indonesia, in an archer. When they reached the shore, it was like, you know, I went when they were there three hours before I reached, and they were like, like dead bodies. It's just unbelievable. <coughs> so this, Exodus of the Rohingya community went on and on, and now we have something like 70,000 of them in Malaysia. There are half a million in Bangladesh. There are about 150,000 in Pakistan. There's about 150,000 in Saudi Arabia. There are about 30 to 40,000 in Thailand. And some 1,000 or so in, in uh, Indonesia. And this exodus of people coming are not only subjected to this kind of you know, uncertain future on the sea, but they've also been faced by the syndicates of human traffickers. So when they come to the sea, they will be interjected and they will be sold on the sea like a price of maybe not more than 50 pounds per head. And then it will be brought to the land in, in Thailand. There is a syndicate between the, the agents and also the armies. And then they are brought to the border of Thailand and Malaysia. And then the transaction starts. If you can't pay 2,000 ringgit in our currency, that's about probably uh, less than three, probably 300 pounds. If you don't pay, then you don't get into Malaysia. If you don't have the money, you give a number, then you can call your relatives in Malaysia. If they can't pay, then you will end up dead. So we found the graves, mass graves, in the border of Thailand and Malaysia. It was shocking. So the, the events that took place was even worse when in 2012, we mooted this idea, we cannot go inside Myanmar, so we have no choice but to organize a flotilla. At that year, we call it Rescue the Last Rohingya. But we couldn't find a ship because nobody wants to insure. There was no insurance company wants to take the ship. So we failed. We sort of uh, put on hold this idea, and we went into Myanmar for s several missions, simulated missions, and we were allowed in a very strict, restricted manner to go and see some places of the IDP camps, the internal displaced people camps. There were 170,000 of them. They were not allowed to move from one camp to another. They were not allowed to even get jobs, they just have to be there in that place, and they suffer. So very restricted numbers of agencies could go in and try to help these people. Then, up until last October 2016, another wave of message strike. And this time, whenever people ask me what's happening, I say, this is the last phase of genocide for the Rohingya. And I spoke in Tehran with Brother Masud. I said, if nothing is done, within the next three, four months, there will not be one more soul left anymore. They are down now right to only 400,000. 
It used to be 4 billion, now they are left with only 400,000 and they are trapped. The Bangladesh government has closed the border. It's just like Egypt. They have the sea, the Bay of Bengal, and they are surrounded by the armies. So it's exactly like the second Gaza. Nobody goes in, nobody goes out. And they will be slaughtered. I gathered people around and said, look, this is the final thing. If we don't do it now, we're going to answer to God. And it's just next to our doorstep. Myanmar is not like Gaza, you know, like, like anywhere else. It's there. It's, it's two hours uh, flight from Kuala Lumpur. And I said, we have to find the ship now. So we scouted and we organized and we campaigned. We found this ship. And now we call it the food flotilla for Myanmar. I'm going to just be very, very brief on this. Now this food flotilla, we, we were sleepless for the last three months. We were really working on this so hard that we wanted it to be an international move. It is not just a Malaysian move. It has to be international. One, we have to save these people because they are they're going to die without food. And many of them are, are injured. There's no medication, nothing. We have to help them immediately to disperse this. And second, we want the whole world to focus on this. Because the UN, United Nations, has issued I think one, more than two resolutions, nothing happened. Obama came to Myanmar two times. This is unprecedented. Now the president of the United States of America goes to this country because they were adoring this girl, Aung San Suu Kyi. He was hoping that Myanmar is going to change. And then he came there and said that, you know, we hope there's a transition for Myanmar or not. Nothing happened. They keep on killing these people. OIC become toothless, they, they won't become non-effective, nothing has been done, only resolution. ASEAN, the grouping of 10 countries, also failed to do anything. So all this happened and now we have decided to go in.